الحمد لله ثم الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله وما توفيقنا إلا بالله وما توكلنا إلا على الله والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأطهران على سيدنا وحبيبنا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفيه وقليله خير نبي اجتباه ورحمة للعالمين أرسله أرسله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا أما بعد أيها الإخوة الكرام يقول ربنا تبارك وتعالى في محكم كتابه في سورة الأنكبوت أتل ما أوحي إليك من الكتاب وأقم الصلاة إن الصلاة تنهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون For many Muslims, for decades and for generations people have been praying and people have been calling out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in the earlier generations of Islam the salah, the foundation or the pillar of Islam its meaning, its purpose was known but unfortunately in the day and age that we live in, many people, the meaning or the maqsad or the purpose of salah is lost upon them. If you ask a young child, why do you pray? They'll say, because my parents told me to do so. And the same answer many adults will give, because I learned to do so, because somebody told me to do so. But the reality is the question of لماذا نصلي why do we pray salah evades many of us and it's a question that you can only answer if you know the benefits of salah in the first place the benefits themselves are linked to the purpose of salah الجواب العام or the general answer that we hear is وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ that man and jinn kind have been created to worship and therefore we worship and therefore we have salah. But this is jawab al This is the general answer that's given. But there is al jawab al khas. There is a specific answer. And we only know the specific answer through the benefits of salah. And there are two main benefits that the ulama after going through the Quran and doing istiqra of the Quran and checking various verses, they came out with two. The first of these is that ذِكْرُ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ To remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the second thing is حُسْنُ السُّلُوكِ مَعَ تَعَامُلِ الْآخَرِينَ The second thing is how we deal and how we talk with other people, how we interact with other people. These are the two benefits of salah. In the first khutbah, we'll talk about the first one, which is the remembrance of Allah. And the second one, we'll talk about how the salah benefits in terms of our dealings with other people. But before we go into what dhikrullah is, what is dhikrullah? When we translate dhikrullah, many of us will say it's the remembrance of Allah. But what is the remembrance of Allah? What does this even mean? The ulama, they take the word dhikr, which we translate as remembrance, and they say, لَيْسَ مَأْخُوذٌ مِّنَ التَّلَفُّضٍ بَلْ مِنَ الذاكرة. That this word of remembrance is not something that is simply uttered on the tongue like SubhanAllah, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah like how we do in our salah and after salah we just we repeat it like parrots. However, dhikrullah number one it starts in the mind. It starts in the intellect. It starts in the feelings. It starts in the emotions. That is where the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes place. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an, He gives us a perfect example. He says, أَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِي That establish the prayer for my remembrance. It's not just verbal remembrance. But it is so when we are praying, we are remembering Allah in our heart, in our mind, in our emotions, in our feelings, in our needs, in our difficulties, in our hardships. All of those things, we're remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala up here. We're remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our mind. 
what happens with most people is that they pray salah like robots. They're not thinking about Allah. They might be saying the words and they might say, be saying Bismillah and they might be saying Alhamdulillah and they might be mentioning the name of Allah, but Allah is the farthest thing from their mind. So this is number one, that as Muslims, we, when we are praying, the first purpose of salah, the first benefit of salah is to remember Allah and remembrance before it takes place on the tongue, it must take place in the mind and in the heart. They say, حُدُورُ الله لدى ذاكرة الإنسان ومشاعره ووجدانه وليس المقصود الذكر اللساني That the main purpose of salah is that we bring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's presence in our minds, in our emotions, in the way that we live, and not simply just by saying it on the tongue. This is the first thing that we have to understand, right? As for what is said on the tongue, this is proof for what we are feeling in our hearts and our minds, right? أَمَّا الْأَصْلِ مَحَلُّهُ الْعَقْلِ That the remembrance of Allah, the main place of it is not the tongue, it's the mind, first and foremost. And this is why as Muslims, when we are praying salah, we might be saying the words, but we're thinking about next tomorrow's game, or we're thinking about work, or we're thinking about picking up our kids. But our mind is not there in salah, right? And this is why as Muslims, when we stopped understanding that the salah is not only something that we do on the tongue, we started losing the meaning and the value of salah. And this is why the ulama, they say that if you want to figure out which people understood the meaning of salah, look to two groups in particular. The first group is the first generation of Islam, the sahaba. That when they prayed, they were the best of worshippers. And the second group, they stay were the Hawariyin of Isa, the students of Isa alayhi salam, those that were his, uh, those that sought knowledge with him. These were the two groups of people that used to be the best of worshippers, the Sahaba and the people that followed Isa alayhi salam from the first generation. That they were so engrossed into their salah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala filled their minds such to a degree that they would lose all sense of their surroundings at times because of how much their salah led them to think about Allah. Because they knew that we are really praying to Allah. And I'll give you an example to make it clear. If I told somebody to make sajda to somebody else, what's going to happen to everybody in here? Your skin is going to start itching and you're going to be like, what? No, we can't do this. This is wrong. We can't make sajda to anyone other than Allah. That we become so repulsed by this. But how is it that when we are making sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we don't shake either? That it's normal for us. This is what sajda is. أَقْرَبُ مَا يَكُونُ الْعَبْدِ فِي السُّجُودِ That the closest that a man or a servant of Allah is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in his sujood. That that sujood is supposed to shake you itself. This is what, it, this is how those people used to pray, right? That they would think, أَنَّنِي أَسْجُدُ لِلَّهِ That I am making sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? At that moment, they understood the value of sajda. And there is a great story for us to look at, and that is the story of Urwa radiallahu anhu, who was the son of Zubair ibn al-Awam. He had some sort of disease or some sort of difficulty in his foot. And one of the khalifas at that time, he sent a surgeon to amputate Urwa's foot. And as that man came to amputate Urwa's foot, the surgeon, he said that, should I give you something that will, you know, numb the pain for you? Should I give you khamr? Should I give you wine to drink so that you don't feel the pain when I amputate your feet? And he said, لا, لا أستعين بالمحرم that I don't take help from that which is haram. Right? He said, لا أستعين بالمحرم He said, I'm not going to take help from that which is haram. He said, let me do something. Let me start my salah. And as soon as I start my salah, take, amputate my foot at that moment. And as soon as they did it, he, st- he began his salah. He started, he got into his salah. They amputated it. He didn't even notice. But because of the rush of blood that came out, he fainted on the point right there. He fainted and he woke up. And he woke up and he called and he said to the surgeon, bring me my feet, bring me my feet. And then he looks at his feet and he says, wallahi, wallahi. He says, oh Allah, I never use these feet to walk towards anything haram. 
This is the salah. That the salah was such that it even distracted them from the worst pain possible. Right? Na'mal distraction, the best distraction possible, right? This was their salah. This is how they were into their salah, right? And the next thing is that when we as Muslims, when we are saying Allahu Akbar, when Urwa said Allahu Akbar, he meant it in his heart. He was saying Allah is greater than my pain. Allah is greater than my worries. Allah is greater than everything. This is what Allahu Akbar means. That when you're raising your hands and they're lifting up, you're saying, I'm throwing everything behind me. Nothing else matters. The only thing that matters is Allah. This is what it means to remember Allah. This is what it means to bring Allah in your heart and your mind and your intellect. This is what it is. But again, for many people, this might seem like theoretical speech. But the reality is that this speech, it requires tatbiq, it requires practice, it requires consistency, it requires taking your time. The ulama, they've written books about asrar al-salah. Right? Many of us, we know the fiqh of salah. We know the as-salah al-shakli. We know how the salah is outside. We know where our hands are supposed to be placed. We know how to do ruku. We know how to do sujood. We know the shakl of salah. But we don't know the madmoon of salah, which is what is inside the salah. What is khushu? What is concentration? What is khudu? What is humility? These things, they have to be studied. And it's not one khutbah that suffices for them. It takes time to study. Just like as little kids, we teach our kids the steps of salah, we're supposed to also be teaching them these things. And as adults, if we don't know, we're also supposed to be learning. Right? This is how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he would pray, he would feel the halawa, he'd feel the sweetness of salah, because they knew about the secrets of salah. They knew the actual purpose of salah. Right? And in some narrations, it comes that Abdullah ibn Shukhair, he says that I came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam while he was praying, I saw his chest azirun ka azir al-mirjal min al-buka. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he was praying, his chest was shaking so much like that of a boiling kettle. That's how much love was going through the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for his Rabb. And then we ask, where is our salah from the salah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? We've all read the book, Sifatu Salat al-Nabi. We know, we've read Shaykh al-Bani's book about how do we pray salah according to the sunnah and according to the Qur'an. But where are the secrets of salah? Where is the meaning of salah? Where is the maqasid of salah when we are actually praying salah? Where is the purpose of it? We've made the appearance, but the inside is not the same. And the last thing that I want to mention before we go into the next khutbah, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says something to us, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, إِذَا نُودِيَ لِلصَّلَاةِ مِنْ يَوْمِ الْجُمْعَةِ فَاسْعَوْا إِلَىٰ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ That, O oh people who believe when you are called for Jum'ah, rush towards the remembrance of Allah. But in reality, we pray. But what is prayer except the remembrance of Allah? This is what is meant, that when we are here, our goal is everything else, delete it off your mind, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only thing that matters. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا تقرب الصلاة وأنتم سكارى That do not come to salah in a state of intoxication. حتى تعلموا ما تقولون So you know what you are saying in your salah. So you understand the meaning and you comprehend what you are saying. Right? The ulama, they say that as Muslims, the main purpose of salah, the qira'ah, the ruku', the sujood, is for you to understand what you're saying. Hatta ta'lamu ma taqulun. This is being said to the person who is intoxicated. But imagine the person who is not intoxicated, yet he doesn't know what he's saying in salah. Right? So again, as Muslims, we are supposed to know what we're doing in our salah, we're supposed to know what we're saying and we're supposed to understand the meaning and that is ultimately the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us understanding. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa li sa'ir al-muslimin fa astaghfiru annahu huwa al-ghafur rahim.
الحمد لله على احسانه والشكر له على توفيقه وامتنانه واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد اوصيكم ونفسي بتقوى الله عز وجل في السر والعلانيه لان الله تبارك وتعالى قال يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون وقال تعالى ان الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا ايها الذين امنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله واصحابه اجمعين عبد الله بن عباس when talking to his students he used to say لا تنثروه نثر الدقل ولا تحذوها حذ الشعر قفوا عند حجائبه وحركوا به القلوب ولا يكن هم احدكم اخر السوره that he would go to his students, especially when they would be leading salah and taraweeh and so on and so forth, and he would say, do not scatter the Qur'an as if it were, as if it were dates falling from a tree, meaning read it in its order, nor recite it quickly as if it's poetry, but do this instead. He said, stop at its verses that amaze you and let it move your hearts. Give the Qur'an a chance. Let not your concern be reaching the end of the surah. Let not your concern be reaching the end of the surah. How many of us when we're praying salah, our concern is, how can I read the shortest surah? How can I be done the fastest? If the Imam Sahib can read the shortest surah, I can be done the fastest. That's what we made our concern. But yeah, Abdullah ibn, Abba, Abdul, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he's saying that don't make that your concern when you're listening and when you're reading the Qur'an, especially in the salah. Right? And Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, a man came to him and he says, Ya Abu Hanifa, I lost my money. I can't find my money. I need to know where it is. What does Abu Hanifa he tell him? He says, go and establish two rak'ahs of prayer. Go and establish two rak'ahs of prayer. And the man, as soon as he begins praying salah, he remembers where his money is. You know why he remembers where his money is? It's because, وَيَصُدَّكُمْ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَعَنِ الصَّلَاةِ فَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ مُنْتَهُونَ Because at that moment, as soon as that man started praying, shaitan came to him and he said, your money is over there, start thinking about your money. Right? This was a story that Imam has narrated about Imam Abu Hanifa. Right? Again, the shaitan's goal and main purpose when it comes to our salah it's وَيَصُدَّكُمْ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَيَصُدَّكُمْ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ That he wants to come and prevent you from remembering Allah in your heart and mind. He's not going to stop your tongue. He's not going to grab your tongue. Your tongue will continue to move. But what he's going to do is make you forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the salah even if your tongue is moving. وَعَنِ الصَّلَاةِ فَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ مُنْتَهُونَ Should you not abstain from this? This is the first benefit of salah. That the main purpose of it is to remember Allah. The second thing is تحسين السلوك الإنساني To rectify the way that you and me as a human behaves in regards to other people. And the proof for this is in Surah Al-Ankabut in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam أُتْلُ مَا أُوحِيَ إِلَيْكِ Ya Muhammad, recite what, you, what has been revealed upon you مِنَ الْكِتَابِ from the Qur'an وَأَقِمِ الصَّلَاةِ and establish the prayer إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ تَنْهَا عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ That indeed the salah, it comes and it tells you no. It tells you no towards what? The fahsha and the munkar, that which is oppression or hurting or harming other people. وَالْمُنْكَرِ That which is a sin against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَا ذِكْرُ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرِ And the remembrance of Allah in the form of salah is greater than all the other forms of ta'ah. وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ مَا تَصْنَعُونَ And Allah knows that what you do. In this surah, in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does say, إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ تَصُدُّ عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ That the salah comes and it blocks you from doing evil. No. What the salah does for the person that prays it properly, remembering Allah and bringing Allah in mind, that same salah will come right when you want to do sin. It will say, يَا أَحْمَدْ يَا مُحَمَّدْ يَا حَمْزَ يَا عَيْشَ يَا فَاطِمَة no, don't do this. Your salah will stop you from hurting other people. Your salah will prevent you from treating other people with ill and to take grudges and revenge and all of these things. That's what the salah does. This is the purpose of salah. Right? Al-fahsha is oppression, taking something away from somebody else, doing something wrong to somebody. Right? This salah, it comes. And we pray it five times a day. Why? 
Because every single time the salah is like a charger. It goes into us. We pray Fajr Salah, it keeps us away from sin all the way to the Dhuhr. But just like the charger's battery goes down, the same exact way our battery, our Iman goes down, and therefore Dhuhr comes in, then Asr comes in, then Maghrib comes in, then Isha comes in. All of these serve as a reminder, number one, to remember Allah, and number two, as a reminder of how you treat other people on the face of this planet. This is the Salah. They say the ulama, as-salatu kanat akbaru wa'zin sahaba That all of the speeches that you take in the world, they don't have the same effect. But the salah, it was the greatest advice and reminder for the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. The salah itself is what they reminded them, right? But today, our ruku, our sujood, all of these different things, they've become habitual to us. We don't really think about them. And so at the end of the day, my main message to you today is when you pray salah, it will take time, it will take practice. And some people might say, oh, the khutbah was so boring. But the reality is that this is something that is important for every single Muslim, no matter who it is, young or old, that when you're praying salah, think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you don't know Arabic, start your journey on learning Arabic. Whatever it takes for you to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, begin doing it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teach us and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for our shortcomings and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teach us to pray salah the way that the sahaba prayed salah, the way that the students of Isa alayhi salam prayed salah and the way that the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam truly taught us to pray salah. Allahumma la tada' lana dhanban illa ghafartah wa la hamman illa farrajtah wa la daynan illa qadaytah wa la maridan illa shafaytah wa la dhalan illa hadaytah wa la mubtalan illa عافيته يا رب العالمين إن الله يأمركم بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروا الله يذكركم واشكروه على نعمه يزدكم أقم الصلاة